Welcome to episode 57, Michigan. Today we discuss the Hell's Bridge or Hell's Gate? Hell's Bridge in Algoma Township. And then we'll get into the tale of Dennis DePue. I'm your host, Chris, and always joining me is my buddy James. What's up, bud? What's up, Chris? How you doing this evening, brother? Doing well, doing well. Enjoying this fall slash winter weather. We are finally getting here in Houston. Indeed. It feels good. It feels cool. We had a nice, cool uh, Halloween, thank goodness, because the week before was like 90 degrees. Blistering, yes. Yes. It so, horrible. Uh, it's finally fall. It's finally winter. I'm excited because it it, it gets dark like at 530 now, so before I get home, it's dark. Yeah, and I love it because it gets dark out where I'm at, and you can't see Jack. The stars uh, are shining. Nice. There's only one light outside, and it's from the uh, funeral funeral home next door <laughs> oh that's wonderful yeah but that's nice Perfect. hey yeah. they're quiet neighbors man they don't make any noise so they're good speaking of death let's get into the uh hell's bridge shall we yes we shall this week's evil and i do mean evil point of interest takes us to a country road outside of rockford to a location with a very horrifying and heartbreaking history the place nicknamed hell's bridge is tucked away in the woods off of frisk drive Frisk Drive. <laughs> I I want to say Frisk Road, but uh, it is Frisk Drive near Rockford. There you will find a small metal bridge extending over the Rogue River slash Cedar Creek. It, it has been known to go by both names. Okay. And at first glance, you would not think much of it. It's not some spectacular architectural accomplishment. In fact, you could say it is you know rather boring to look at. But never in one's imagination could you believe the horrors that occurred here in the mid-1800s. But, alas, that is what brings us to this obscure, out-of-the-way location. And let's get into why they call it the Hell's Bridge. What do you say? I'm ready. Let's do it. In the small township of Algoma, near Rockford, lived an older man named Elias Frisk. He seemed harmless enough. As, As a matter of fact, the townspeople... You know, thought very highly of this guy and very, you know, considered him very trustworthy. Enough so that when there were several children reported missing and the town organized a search party to go find them, they left the other children under the care of Elias while they were gone. This would turn out to be a huge and very tragic mistake. Uh Uh-oh. As the town folk departed to search for their missing kids, Elias, under the guise of, quote-unquote, not wanting the children to wander off, got a long rope and tied the children together in a group, then proceeded to march them into the woods in the opposite direction as to avoid being detected by the search party members. As he approached the area of the bridge, it is said the children became so scared and also started to complain of rancid odors in the, in, you know, in the general vicinity. Oh, yeah, pretty nasty. Frisk then tied the group of kids to a tree and removed a huge pile of sticks and leaves to expose the bodies of several murdered children. Whoa. Yeah, it's messed up. The tethered group screamed and cried out, but to no avail, because their parents were off in the other direction. Then, feverishly, in a bloodthirsty rage out of nowhere, Frisk began to butcher the children one by one until he had killed them all. He then proceeded to throw the bodies into the icy waters and ran deeper into the woods. Back in Algoma, upon returning to town, the adults in the search party soon realized something was very wrong. There was no Frisk and no sign of the children. They all quickly returned to the woods in search of Frisk and the children he was charged with looking after. As fate would have it, the search eventually led to a newly constructed bridge and in the icy waters of the Rogue River beneath the structure, they discovered several bodies of slain children. Wow. Definitely, this is sad. Man. Wow, sad, man. Sad, sad, Serial child killer, huh? Yeah. Now, of course, most of the townspeople were overwhelmed with grief and unable to function temporarily, as one would expect from such a shock. Yeah. You know, how, God, I, mean, I can't even think of something that horrible. Yeah. Jeez. That, that's, that's crazy discovery right there. Yeah. One man, however, and fortunately they did not give a name, did gather himself and followed a trail of footprints he saw going into the woods. It would not take him long to discover Frisk, cowering, shaking, and covered in blood. Ooh. Yeah. He cried in vain that the devil made him do it, but to no avail. They did not care to hear his wild claims, and in a rage, the townspeople immediately grabbed the rope he had used on the children bound him and swiftly without trial or due process hung him from the bridge nice i love it 
Justice was served swiftly and justly. Now, it is said that he was left there hanging. They didn't cut him down. They just left him there. Okay. And eventually the water swelled at one point, snapped the rope, and carried his body off to hell. <laughs> Good. Where it belongs. He deserves it. That is the basis for the legend. Records do indicate that there were murders of children that occurred around that time. However, census records do not show any Frisk family members or names in that area until around 1910. You know, was his persona created from the name of the road, perhaps? Or, you know, were they so filled with hate that they scrubbed his name from any county or township records and never spoke of him? I mean, I don't know. As we have seen with many attempts at erasing history, it simply cannot be done because you remove or erase something. Someone killed those poor children, and frankly, I do not give one damn what his name was. You know, what a piece of crap. And we can only hope that the murderer receives the swift and just punishment that was inflicted in the story. At least I hope so. Oh, yeah. Hopefully he was beaten up a little bit first, too, you know. Oh, yeah. Of course, with all legends and scary events, there are also reports of paranormal activity in the area, such as children crying screams, and apparitions of children wandering in the woods. And I can't think of anything sadder than that. That just sucks. One of the more disturbing claims, that is if you are tubing down the river, you need to keep your feet up as you approach the bridge because you may feel someone trying to pull you under (laughs) and or little hands trying to get you to rescue them. Cool. Now, I can't think of anything sadder than that. You feel little hands grabbing at you to get out of the water. How heartbreaking. Also, if you stand on the bridge in the middle of the night, you can hear the devil's laughter, and it is also said that the bridge does move. <laughs> yeah, that would kind of suck. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be down for that. I would, that definitely. I want to hear a devil laugh. Absolutely. The area is still accessible, but the old bridge has been replaced with the aforementioned metal plank bridge. It's yeah. I've, I have looked up pictures of it. It's yeah. very plain. There's no rails, no nothing. It's, it's it's almost just like a little quick walkway. So it hides yeah. its dark dark secret beneath it a does. facade of modernism, huh? Yeah. This is yet another area that when I am back up that way, you can bet I will go out on my way to investigate. I hope so. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna try to seek some evidence of the paranormal in some way. Try to give those poor babies some peace if I can. I mean, I don't know if I can or not, but you know, give it a shot. You know, as far as Frisk or whatever his name might be, may the fires of hell roast you unmercifully for what you did. You were put to death swiftly, so we were told. But in some way, I hope the parents exacted a little revenge before stretching his neck. Sort of like a Freddy Cougar situation. Absolutely. And like I said, I did look up some pictures of it. And yeah. I did. Uh, there were several people that had orbs and stuff like that okay See, i have a huge problem with that because right. you've got a raging river underneath the bridge yeah they're bullshit anyway so they're yeah and there's these things floating in there uh they had a couple of long streaky looking ones and stuff okay like that, but nothing very impressive so just what i basically explain you so, know the local legend of the okay. seeing the apparitions you got uh you know the, the bridge moves in the middle of the night on its own okay if you're standing on it you hear the devil's laugh things like that okay but and they're all substantiated through i've looked up several sources and those okay. are pretty much the only things they're repeated basically gotcha so, okay cool unfortunately it didn't you know there were no names and nothing like that and there wasn't really any more deeper information that's why i kind of like this it's a horrible story uh but man i'm gonna tell you what so um it's something that hasn't been widely investigated by other groups so we could probably jump on it and investigate it ourselves and yeah i'm thinking most of the people that probably went there are probably teenagers thrill seekers and legend trippers things like that yeah nobody who's truly trying to find some real evidence so we need to be the first to get on that yes cool all right, man. Well, another cool story. Uh, I always yeah. love hearing about Hell's anything in hell's this country. Hell's anything. There's Hell's yeah. Bridges, Hell's Tunnels, Hell's... Uh, what was the other one? The Hell's Bridge in the New hell's York. Gate. Hell's Gate. The hell's in New Gate. York. Yep. Yeah, I love hearing about all the hell <laughs> we have in this country. And Maltby Cemetery had the 13, 13 steps, steps to, to hell. hell. I That's mean, it's right. like everything's hell bound. But then again, in this particular case, I think it fits. You know, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very horrible, horrible story. You know, you trust a guy like that. And I did see a picture of him, and he looked like he was maybe in his 40s. Just a standard runner mill guy? They called him an older gentleman, but Uh I guess back then it was in the 1800s. Yeah, yeah. because, you know, back then you had to be married by, like, yeah, 
Because you know people were so trusting back then. Yeah. So he was he was truly a demon then. Yep. So wow. We need to get out to that Algoma Township and check it out. I'm down, dude. Let's do it. It's right off Frisk Road. You get on Frisk Drive, and, and it's right there. They, they said it's still it's still right there. So we got to make sure we're there in the middle well, of the night. And, and that's why I said that's why I do these uh, these particular the point of interest rather mm-hmm. than just a you know like a paranormal thing or something like that. Yeah. I want to actually tell you about places that you can actually physically go gotcha. and investigate that are accessible. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to tell somebody about something that you can't get to. Well, except Maltby's. Maltby's, yeah. Well, and they shut it down because of idiots. Well, you know, there's a lot so. of those out there. <laughs> yes, there are, unfortunately. Stop, cool. stop messing with the stuff. <laughs> or, Respect the rules and quit ruining it for other people. You listening out there? Jeez. Just, you know, go and, you know, Take pictures, but leave no traces. Exactly. What was that? What is that saying? Um, well, I always say leave the area better than you found it, that if, too. if you can. But uh, I, I think it's something like um, leave no trace, take only pictures, something like that. It's, something it's basically like saying don't don't mess with don't mess with areas. Just take a picture or yeah, whatever. Don't, don't don't mess it up. Don't mess it up for the rest of us. That's right. You know we want to go investigate these places too. So quit. Amen to that. Quit jacking it up. Yep. Let's go ahead and get into the uh, next story, shall we? Indeed. You need a break, brother? You ready to just keep rolling? Yeah, let's take a quick break. I'm going to grab a drink, and then we will get started. (laughs) All right. Drink a drink. Okay, James, tell me if this scenario sounds familiar. Okay. On a lonely back country road one day, a couple are enjoying a nice leisurely drive. Suddenly a van speeds up from behind them and passes them. As it drives away, the woman notices the license plate begins with GZ. Now the couple always play a game while driving in which they make words or phrases out of license plates. Hmm. The woman comes up with, geez, he's really in a hurry. (laughs) As the van speeds out of sight. Later down the road, the couple approach an abandoned building and notice the van parked outside it. As they approach the building, they see a man carrying a bloody sheet out of the van and trying to dispose of it behind the building. Hmm. Moments later, the van comes barreling up behind them and rides their rear bumper for two miles until they pull off the highway. Uh, Why in the hell would you do that? (laughs) Now... To many people, that scenario sounds just like the beginning of the 2001 horror movie Jeepers Creepers. Yes, it does. But the scenario is also one that played out in real life on April 15th, 1990, just outside of Coldwater, Michigan. Holy crap. Now, for the record, I love Jeepers Creepers. <laughs> that, 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 those movies are great. I enjoy the movies. I just, I'm, I'm hoping that they get a whole different director. Yeah. Um, cause the original director is a pedophile. So, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, they need to, a fact I was not aware of. Yeah. I wasn't either until I saw some behind the scenes stuff and he is a, he's a convicted pedophile. So they need to get a new director to continue that series. Cause I enjoy the series. Yeah. yeah. That day, Ray and Marie Thornton set out on their usual Sunday leisure drive when they crossed paths with Dennis Depew. 46 year old Dennis Depew and his 48 year old wife, Marilyn, seemed to have a typical middle-class life. Dennis was a property assessor for the state of Michigan. Marilyn was a counselor at Coldwater High School, and they lived in Coldwater along with their three children. However, not long after the kids were born, Dennis became withdrawn and accusatory of Marilyn. He isolated himself from the family. Their daughter, Julie, would recall that they barely spoke to each other. Marilyn would often tell her co-worker, Anne, about how unhappy she had become in the marriage And in 1989, she filed for divorce after 18 years of marriage. It happens. It happens. Yes, it does. When asked why she wanted to get a divorce, she said that the marriage was broken up. She told her lawyer, Richard Kolbeck, that she wanted to be more of her own person, raising her family as she saw fit. She felt that Dennis was trying to dominate her, run her life, 
and not allow her to make decisions that she wanted to make. Sounds like a narcissistic prick to me. Yes, he is. Dennis agreed to let her have primary custody of the children. And regarding their property, he was very willing to allow her to have most of the property that she wanted. Despite Dennis's attempt to keep the marriage intact, the divorce became final in December of 1989. He was granted bi-weekly visitation rights, but the children are often reluctant to spend time with him because he's a prick. Mm -hmm. He was also granted access to the guest house, which he used both as an office and as an excuse to maintain control over his family. Mm -hmm. After the divorce, Marilyn changed all the locks on the house's doors. Despite this, one day she came home and found him sitting on the couch. Bastard. Psychopath. He had, she had no idea how he got in because he did not have access to the new keys for the doors. She told Anne that she was frightened about this. And then one day out of the blue, Dennis indicated to his coworker, Jen Mikowski, that he was contemplating suicide and murder. On Easter Sunday, 1990, Dennis arrived to pick up two of the children for a visit, as Julie had already refused to go with him. What, what is it about Easter Sunday and people wanting to kill on that? It's, I think it's just another holiday. It's just, it's, uh, I mean, after New Year's, I think it's the first big holiday. Cause you, I guess you yeah. can count, you can count Valentine's. Well, that's a horrible holiday to kill somebody. I mean, yeah. it's never any holiday to kill is somebody, a, yeah, but, but like I said, cause in a previous story I had done, I remember there was a guy that was killed with shotguns and that lady that hired them high school boys. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they killed him on an Easter, Easter Sunday. Sunday. Maybe it's because they have the, the weekend off or something, or they have Monday know. off, and they have more time to do killing, I guess. I suppose. Uh -huh. When their son, Scott, asked to stay a bit longer, Dennis became angry with him. Marilyn and Dennis then got into an argument in which he was blaming her for ruining his life. Of course, he always blames other people. Mm -hmm. As he pushed her down the hallway, he began to hit her as her children pleaded with him to stop. Then he pushed her down the stairs, and she fell onto a landing. He went to her and began to hit her more. Their oldest daughter, Jennifer, ran to a neighbor's house to call the sheriff's office. At the same time, Dennis took a severely injured Marilyn up the stairs. As he dragged her out to his van, he told the children that he was going to take her to the hospital. Julie noticed that she was not walking on her own. Mm -hmm. When Julie called out to her, she didn't respond, appearing to be in a daze. The Depews never arrived at the hospital. Of course not. Sheriff's deputies and the Michigan State Police immediately began a search for them. And that's where we pick back up with the Thorntons. Now, after they turned off the freeway, the van pulled off to the side of the road. Oh, this is one of those six hours earlier kind of scenarios or something. Exactly. Right? Yep. Just like, yep. Six oh. previously or six hours earlier or something like that. Then yeah. We, then we catch up all of a sudden. The Thorntons decided to turn around and come back in an attempt to get a full license plate number. As they approached, they noticed that the man was changing his license plate. Marie also noticed that the front passenger door was covered with blood. Oh, boy. Fearing the worst, the Thorntons returned to the schoolhouse to search for the bloody blanket. They found it partially stuffed into a small animal hole and it immediately went and contacted the police. The area was quickly cordoned off. The authorities began to assume the worst that Marilyn was probably dead. They discovered fresh tire tracks and a large pool of blood at the scene and the tracks were later matched to Dennis's van, and the blood was matched to Marilyn's. Yeah, see, and if there's a large pool there, there's blood all over the van. She's obviously That's bleeding a lot of, out. She's probably, yeah. A lot of blood loss. Mm-hmm. Horrible. The next day, a highway worker discovered Marilyn's body just off the deserted road in Bethel Township, midway between the schoolhouse and her home. She had been shot once in the back of the head. Bastard. Just days later, Dennis sent a series of wild, rambling letters to friends and relatives, in which he tried to justify her death. To Jan, he wrote, Marilyn had many, many opportunities. That's how he sounds in my head. Like a yeah, little, like a freaking like a little, little boy. Toothless moron. Yeah. Many opportunities to treat me fairly during this divorce, but she chose to take it out, trick me, lie to me. And when you lose your wife, children at home, there's not much left. I'm too old to start over. It's not, it's not funny, but I was trying not to laugh. When you're no, you can laugh. That's boys. fine. It, that's how he sounds because he's a fucking... And when you see a picture of him, you're like, yeah, he, he probably sounds like that. A little weasel. Mm -hmm. Altogether, Dennis sent a total of 17 letters postmarked in Virginia, Iowa, and Oklahoma. Oh, so he was just all, everywhere. Just writing, his li writing his life story. Based on the letters, Anne felt that he was trying to say that Marilyn's friends were the ones that caused her death, even though he was obviously the one that pulled the trigger. Of course, this, this man lives a life of blaming others for his misfailings. Of course he does. Marilyn's parents felt that the only closure they could get regarding her loss 
would be to have Dennis caught. This is a bummer episode, man. All no. this killing going on. Don't worry. It, it, ends, <laughs> it ends better. Three months after the murder, Dennis sent copies of a 13-page letter to a number of friends and relatives. It read like a treatise, a chilling 5,000-word rationalization, which takes liberally from the Bible throughout. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, lie for a lie, a life for a life. I realize that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But sometimes the Lord is busy doing other things. Jeez. Nearly one year after the murder, Dennis's crimes would be featured on a March 1991 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Nice show. Great show. I love that One show. of the best ever. Hell yeah. Robert Stack forever, RIP. Dennis happened to be home that night and saw his story featured. Oh, oh shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, I exactly. Get. I know you're going to get me. <laughs> <laughs> but this time he had moved to Dallas, Texas and changed his name to Hank McQueen. Hank, Hank McQueen. Hank McQueen. Say it in your voice. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Hank McQueen. <laughs> no, I didn't kill my wife. I said, I'm, I'm a good person. Yeah. And was living with a new girlfriend in Dallas. That night when the girlfriend arrived home, she was surprised to find Hank packing up all his things. Well, he's getting the hell out that motherfucker. He's he getting on. He told her that his mother was very ill and that he needed to go home to take care of her. My mommy think I can go home. <laughs> yeah, we can't exactly say, well, Robert Stack is on my ass. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and when Stack's on your ass, you're, you're fucked. That's right. Elliot Ness coming to get you. That's right. He asked her to go in the kitchen and make some sandwiches for his drive. In reality, he was keeping her occupied so she wouldn't see the segment on TV. Oh, My question was, if that was the case, if if that was the case, why would he still have the TV on? Turn that motherfucker off. Kick it in, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Uh-oh, new TV. I'm sorry. He packed up his belongings in his green 1984 Chevy van, gave her a hug, and took off. She would never see him again and would only learn later of his true identity. Oh, boy. Now, one of his girlfriend's friend saw the program, recognized Dennis, and called the hotline to report him. Four hours later, Louisiana State Trooper spotted his van and embarked on a high-speed chase that lasted for 15 miles. He broke through two barricades, and after his two rear tires were shot out, continued to drive for half a mile before coming to a stop. Being the coward that he was, he then shot at the officers that surrounded his van, firing several shots at them before turning the gun on himself. Oh, damn. I thought he was going to do a suicide by cop thing. You know, a lot of them will do that. Yeah. Get the cops to shoot him. I think he was too much of a coward for that. He, I think he initially started thinking that because that's why he fired at them, but then realized that it might be better just to do himself because he's a fucking coward. What a little turd, man. So, yeah. So, uh, so that Dennis... started in Michigan and ended in Louisiana. Yeah. Via mm-hmm. Oklahoma and Virginia, Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Iowa. Oh, my God. Yeah. He, he, he fled all over the place for a whole year getting rid uh, trying to, trying to out, outrun the law. Didn't work, did it? It did fine until you, you know, Stack got him. You can't outrun you Stack. Can't outrun Stack. No, nope. even, even up in heaven, Stack is still getting motherfuckers. That's right. That's right. Because the show runs all the time now and new crimes are being solved all the time. So, yes. But yeah, so I did not know. Uh, I, I, I had watched Unsolved Mysteries growing up every episode Mm -hmm. but there was a long period because after stack passed away they tried to continue it with uh uh dennis farina oh yeah um oh mr mr uh hills no law and order law and order guy yeah Yeah. but um they they, like slashed the budget and so like the reenactments weren't that good and they Uh, just they kind of use reenactments from older episodes because they just they ran a lot of the original stories um and then a few new stuff but um and then that one was canceled and then it wasn't until two, three, maybe four years ago that they finally started releasing the episodes on Amazon. Another company came in, bought the rights. Mm-hmm. So before that, you couldn't find them on DVD. You couldn't find them on Blu-ray. They wow. weren't streaming. Um, and I, I remember finding them on YouTube, but every time I would find them and start watching them, the they would be copyrighted and pulled oh, off. Because uh, who, I think it was Cosgrove Entertainment, whoever, didn't want the show shown for some reason. I, I don't know why. So Probably f- because it sucked. No, no, no. Not because it sucks. It was great. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the original stuff. I'm talking about the, the newer ones you said when they screwed the budget. No, th- these were the stack ones. Oh, the stack. I mean, oh, no, hell no. The stack ones were incredible. Because the, the Farina ones, I believe, were still in syndication on reruns. Okay. But the stack ones hadn't been played for like decades. I got you. Yeah. So they've been off. The, okay. Yeah. I, I watched I, them. I misunderstood. I right. thought you were talking about the other guy. No, no, no. Farina no. dude. No, the, the stack ones. And I said, I found those uh, bootleg on YouTube and then they were always pulled off. And then finally. 
I mean, I think in like mid mid two thousands, they released like five different sets, but they were like uh, themed sets. So it was like yeah. a, a, a four pack of DVDs that were all about the UFO stories. Gotcha. One ghost, one legend. Cause I have the UFO and the ghost one. Uh huh. And they're great. I love those ones. But um, you couldn't see the full episodes. And I get them. I think uh, four or five years ago, a company called Film Rise bought the rights. And then started putting them out on uh, Amazon Prime. Sweet. And then just boom, boom, boom. Every few weeks, they'd put another season. And now all 12 seasons are available nice. on Prime, on um, Hulu. Uh, Film Rise uh, has their yeah. own app. So, yeah. So, anyway. So, I recently was rewatching them, as I do, multiple times. I, I've watched them like, you know, I've watched each season like, I don't know, 20 times again. Because I just love the show. But uh, I completely forgot that this particular segment is was an inspiration for Jeepers Creepers. Oh wow. And it was so funny because you know, I think this was like a two, two, three, four years ago. Jeepers Creepers was on like the third one by then. But the first one's iconic. Oh yeah. Especially that beginning scene. Yep. With Justin Long and his sister. Absolutely. You know, in the film they're their brother and sister, but that whole segment is a great setup for later on. And um, I'm watching an episode and then I, I get to that episode and it's just a standard episode, nothing special about it. But I'm watching it and it's it was like crazy scene. I was like, holy crap, this is like Jeepers Creepers. Like, how is that? <laughs> I was like, no way. It's just so close to it. And then like the the way they filmed it. I mean, it was filmed in the '80s, but uh, so obviously it was before Jeepers Creepers. Yeah. But watching, I was like, man, it's so. It is almost closely shot for shot from Jeepers Creepers. Yeah. You know, and I was like, holy crap. So then I look tired looking into it. And I was like, yeah, sure enough, it was. Um, I don't think the director ever full on. Or the, the script writer ever full on acknowledged it, but come on, dude, yeah. you that's that's like Vanilla Ice saying he didn't steal the beat for <laughs> you know uh, under I did, pressure. I, did, I didn't sample under pressure. No, yeah. no, yeah. It seems like he didn't sample under pressure. He the, the director and the writer took that that particular segment of Dennis the Hughes story and full on plagiarized it for their movie. Yeah. Oh jeez! I mean, because it, it fits so well. Yeah, you know, and in the beginning, the, the scenario I gave you seemed it was very vague. Because I wanted to leave the the details out, but even with as vague as a scenario I gave you, I mean, you could probably picture that scene from Jeepers Creepers in your Chip mind. Tail. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so it's crazy how another example of real life influencing horror. Well, it's cool because I never heard of a dip you the 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 douche. Yeah. I yeah. wouldn't call him a lip you because I don't want to insult Peppy. <laughs> but yeah, I've never heard of that guy. So yeah, and he's that's he's not. Cool. I mean, outside of like unsolved mysteries, maybe a couple other true crime podcasts, he's not really talked about much. I mean, well, he good. was. That's the whole point. Thankfully, he only killed one person. Unfortunately, it was yeah. his wife. So obviously, he's not like a heavy hitter or a mass killer. But it's a messed up. It's a messed. Story. It's a messed up ass story. Yes, it is. But it inspired, you know, the beginning of a great horror film. Yes, it did. So, all right. But well, uh, another fun filled episode. I Indeed. think we're heading to the great state of North Dakota. Yes, we are heading to North Dakota next. But before we go, what do we got? We would love it if you folks out there would take the time to give us a rating and review. Uh, if you have any personal stories you'd like to share with us, type those up and send them to us at stateoffearpodcast at gmail.com. And, of course, if you'd like to support the show, we do have a Patreon. www.patreon.com forward slash stateoffear. It is a one-stop shop, seven bucks, and you get access to everything. Our lots of reels, goodies. We have lots of extras coming. We've already got a lot of extras up there. We've got uh, reviews, commentary. We've got... Uh, and just so you know, geez. James and I fuck up a lot, so there's always bloopers. Oh, yeah. Every, there's, there's every tons episodes. of bloopers. Tons every episode. Of bloopers. Uh, uh, even, even video bloopers, which, by the way, <laughs> there's uh, we, we posted a video a while back of James asking for personal stories. and It took me a while. Took him a while, and then I posted the uh, blooper video on our Patreon, and I go back and I watch it like every so often because it makes me cry. Well, I shoot, laughing I every shoot damn from time. The hip. A lot of times when I do this stuff, I like to shoot from the hip. Well, yeah, but it's you know, but it's hilarious. It's, you know it's funny. It's, so if you want to go see James fuck up on video, but we love go to yeah. the Patreon. And now, if you don't want to do the monthly thing, that's right. I was going to add that, but you go ahead. We also do have a buy me a coffee shop. Uh, you can make a one-time donation in any amount that you want. I, be- I believe any amount. I don't really know how that works. I think I think 
you can put any amount. I don't think there's like a set amount, but you can buy us one cup of coffee, two, three, four, five, wherever you want. Yeah. And and it's a one time donation, and it, uh, it goes back to help the show, and it's very, very, very much appreciated. Um, and if you uh, do decide to, then uh, do us another favor and maybe share the link for it. That would be great. Might be other friends you know of that um, that might want to donate, or just share the link for our show. Share it with one friend. Share the YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, subscribe if you get a chance. Speaking uh, of which, uh, I do want to acknowledge a couple of things real quick. Oh, sweet. So I want to acknowledge, first of all, our newest Patreon. Nice. Uh, Elizabeth Miller. Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank Good you so much. Have you. I hope you're enjoying the content. I hope so, too. Um, if you have any ideas for, or suggestions, please uh, put them on the Patreon. And also, I want to uh, give a shout out to our newest YouTube subscribers. Sweet. Uh, Lisa Brickner. Sean Patrick. J Evans 069, Dexter Nor Norwood, Whispers from the Dark Channel, and Southern Renegar Paranormal TV. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for subscribing. I hope you guys are enjoying the content. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Well, why don't we go ahead and get out to the next state and see what kind of stuff we can dig up from there? Let's do it. Let's get the hell up out of here. All right, North Dakota, here we come. Mm -hmm.